Amen. Amen. Well, on this ninth day of Christmas, I want to look forward a little bit. Look forward four days. I'm going to look forward to Thursday. I want to look forward to Epiphany and to the rising star. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. The prophet Isaiah was the one who first spoke of the coming of Christ in the context of a rising star in the midst of darkness. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen Upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations, Gentiles, Goyim, shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. The prophet Isaiah says that in a time of great darkness, the glory of the Lord will begin to shine forth from one who embodies all the promises that God has made to Israel. That is the Messiah, the Christ. The birth of the king of the Jews is what the Magi discerned as they watched the night sky far away in Persia for a very long time. That's the message they read in the stars. And then a star guided them. The journey of the Magi all the way from Persia to Bethlehem is what is called in theological circles the eschatological pilgrimage of the nations. <laughs> As a, I love that phrase, by the way. The eschatological pilgrimage of the nation. It's what, it's what, I'm not going to read the passage, but it's what Isaiah continues to talk about. He says, there'll be a great light in the midst of darkness, and it's going to arise, and the result will have a powerful influence upon the Gentiles, the nations, the Goyim. And he says, they will come with their camels. There's where you get the camels. And they will come bringing their tribute gifts of gold and frankincense. And then you have to wait for Matthew to get to the myrrh, but it shows up. So the Magi, their significance is they were the first Gentiles, people outside of Israel, the first Gentiles to leave their pagan darkness because of the light of Christ. This is epiphany. Ah, ah, we've seen the one who is the true Son of God. Epiphany, revelation. They have seen it. The Magi were the first, but billions have followed, including you and me. Gentiles who found the truth in the light of Christ. Jesus is the rising star that if followed will lead us out of spiritual darkness into salvation. At the very end of the Bible, Jesus says, I am the bright and morning star. Morning star. What's a morning star? It's a star whose rising in the late night heralds the coming of the dawn. The birth of Christ, discerned by the Magi in the rising of a star, announced that a new dawn, a new day, a new age had begun with the birth of the King of the Jews. This is the age of Christ that dawned 2,022 years ago. Happy New Year. And that's how we keep score. That's how we keep track. That's how Christ is the one who divides time. His birth heralds a new day, a new dawn, a new age. Now, we believe that Jesus is the morning star whose rising signals a new dawn for humanity. You, you believe that, right? That Jesus is the rising star, the appearance of which heralds a new 
day, a new dawn, a new beginning for humanity. Then, as the Apostle Peter says, you do well to pay attention until that star rises in your heart. So the star that the Magi saw is that they saw rise and they discerned its meaning. That's, that star is to rise in your heart. Apostle Peter talks about it like this. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory saying, This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. In this passage, the Apostle Peter first talks about being with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And hearing the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The same thing the voice said to him at his baptism, which by the way we will look at next Sunday, the baptism of Jesus. Then after referring to the transfiguration, the apostle Peter talks about a more confirming prophetic word than even the audible voice of God, he talks about the word of Christ as it rises in our hearts. And the Apostle Peter encourages us to pay attention to the word of God in our life who is Jesus Christ. We need to pay attention to Christ like a lamp shining in a dark place. And as we pay attention, as we, as we become intentional about our seeking Christ in the midst of our own present darkness, Christ as the morning star will rise in our hearts and we begin to experience our own epiphany. And by our own experience, we know Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the savior of the world. This is the one that I've been waiting for, epiphany. The Magi then are our model for how to encounter Christ as the rising star. The Magi paid attention to the heavens and watched through the long, dark night. And they're reading the stars. And when a star arose that announced that the king of the Jews had been born, they began to seek for Christ. Not to investigate him, but to worship him. The Magi did not come to Bethlehem as journalists or as academics. They came as worshipers. They didn't come to, well, we better check this out and write a scholarly paper on this. No, they came to bow down and do homage and present gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They came as worshipers. You can learn some things about the historical Jesus of Nazareth as an investigator in an academic sense. But you will never encounter the risen Christ until you come to him as a worshiper. I won't say that again. You will never subjectively, personally, face to face, have your own epiphany of encountering the risen living Christ until you come to him as a worshiper. Now, this is offensive to modern people. Modern people say, no, 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 no. I have to be, you got to prove it to me. You got to prove it to me. And then I'll worship. Sorry. No, the gospel is not a proof. It's not an argument. It's an announcement. It's a kirgma. It's a proclamation. Jesus is Lord. Worship him. And they said, well, no, you have to prove it to me. People try to stop me. Shake me up in my mind. They say, prove to me he's Lord. Show me a sign. I say, what kind of sign they need? When it all comes from within. 
when what's lost has been found, what's to come has already been. I just keep pressing on. Amen. That was better than you think. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. The gospel proclamation itself contains the possibility of faith. When I say to you, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus is the Savior of the Lord, with that kerygma, that proclamation, that announcement, there is the capacity to believe it. But, like the Magi, we have to seek the Christ that is being revealed to us as one who is willing to worship him when they find him. Once we begin to perceive the rising star of Christ, we have some decisions to make. Will we embark upon the long, hard journey to realign our life with the rising star? You know, it's not easy to follow a rising star from Persia to Bethlehem. That's a long way, and it's a hard journey. Read T.S. Eliot's Journey of the Magi. I resist because I do this every year, and I thought, okay, I'm not going to force that upon them one more time. But, but I will tell you this, it probably is my all-time favorite poem, Journey of the Magi, by T.S. Eliot. A long, hard going we had of it. If I could quote it, I would right now. Fortunately for you, I can't. But it, no, it's worth investigating. Well, so, so the, the star begins to rise. The star begins to rise for the Magi in the sky, for you and I in our heart. The star begins to rise, but then we have some decisions to make. We begin to get an epiphany. Ah, ah. But that's, that's to launch the journey. It doesn't end the journey. This is what happened to me 18 years ago at a major crossroads in my life. Like exactly 18 years ago. I paid attention. That's why I was paying attention to the word of Christ until the morning star began to rise in my heart. And and I was paying attention to the word of Christ and the morning star was rising in my heart. It really was. But then I had some hard decisions to make. Would I stick with the crowd or reach for the rising star? If I thought about it, I never would have done it. I guess I would have let it slide. If I paid attention to what others were thinking, the heart inside me would have died. But I was just too stubborn to ever be governed by enforced insanity. Somebody had to reach for the rising star. I guess it was up to me. And it is up to me. And it is up to you to decide how we'll respond to the rising star of Christ. Of course, there are some. There are some. Not here. but There are some. Many, in fact. Who question if the star of Christ is still rising. They may say, well, after 2,000 years, haven't we moved now into a thoroughly post-Christian era? Aren't those that still hold on to Christian faith something of a, a relic, an endangered species, soon to be extinct? In a secular world, isn't Christ fated to ultimately be forgotten? If that's the question, the answer is no. (laughs) Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. This is the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. The star of Christ is always rising in the hearts of those who pay attention to. To hear. First they hear and then they pay attention to the prophetic word of the gospel. Those that hear and then pay some attention to the prophetic word of the gospel, for them, the star of Christ is always rising. Years ago, like 15, 16 years ago, I became really fascinated with the star that the Persian Magi saw. What was it? I mean, I just, I find it's a fascinating story that you have these. Zoroastrian, it's a hard word to say by the way, 
Zoroastrian. Astronomers, astrologers, magicians, court advisors, way off in Persia, will look up in the sky and say, King of the Jews is born, get your gold, frankincense, and myrrh, let's go. You know, what did they see? What was happening there? And so I read all kinds of scientific books and learned articles on, you know, what might this be? There are speculations based in academia and astronomy and things like that. Uh, was, it, was it a triple conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in 7 B.C.? Was it an alignment of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn in the constellation of Pisces that would mean something to them? That's one of the ideas. Was it a nova that in fact did suddenly appear in the constellation of Pisces in 5 BC? Or was it all three added up together and they made their calculation and said the king of the Jews is born. We must go and pay him homage. Well, the answer to that question is who knows? Who knows? And to be honest with you, that kind of investigation into the star of Bethlehem no longer interests me. It was a phase I went through. You know, if you're interested in that sort of thing, there's all kinds of information out there you can find it. Some of it better than others. But to be honest, that kind of thing no longer interests me. Whatever the Magi may or may not have seen in the stars 2,000 years ago has no bearing on us. Whatever the Magi may or may not have seen in the stars 2,000 years ago has no bearing on us. What we have is something other. Not a sign you're going to see in the sky. Don't, don't, don't go out there and stare at the sky at night. God, give me a sign. And then you'll see a shooting star and you go, okay, that was it. No. No. We're not going to find what we're looking for by staring at the sky at night. We have a more sure word of prophecy. More sure than an audible voice or a visible star. The more sure word of prophecy is the revelation given to you by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Peter says, you will do well. To pay attention to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Everyone needs a north star, a pole star, a fixed star. You know how you find the, the north star, you know, you got the big dipper got the cup and it points. There it is. We call it the North Star because it's the pole star, because it's a fixed star. That in other words, the constellations of the heavens all are revolving and moving around this one that doesn't move. And once you have located the pole star, the fixed star, then you have a means of navigating, finding your way. Everybody needs a North Star, a Pole Star, a fixed star around which everything re revolves. Now, some choose, these are a couple of relatively popular options. Some choose um, a form of politics. Others pick particular social movements. And then everything in their life, they, they're, going to, they're going to relate to everything by how it relates to their politics or their idea of a certain social movement. Well, the problem with that is those are not fixed stars. Those are wandering stars. Those are wandering stars. They move around. They move around. And you cannot successfully navigate by them. You will find yourself lost in the darkness eventually. If you try to say, okay... These are my politics, and, and this, is, this is what's fixed, and everything has to right and left. And that's a wandering star that will lead you into the darkness. To save the world, 
God did not send a political party or a social movement. I mean, that's, I suppose that was an option. To save the world, God did not send a political party or a social movement. God sent his son, the word made flesh. The true light which, in, which coming into the world enlightens everyone. Now, does the coming of the true light into the world which enlightens everyone, does that have political and social implications and ramifications? Of course it does. Of course it does. But it comes from our response to the light that is Christ, not from a devotion to a particular moment in time, to a particular political movement or social idea. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't know. Let him who has ears to hear, hear. Jesus is the North Star, the fixed star, the pole star. And if you really truly locate Jesus and keep your eye on him as the light of the world, everything else will fall in the right place. And you'll be able to, you'll be able to say, okay, I'm here, I'm here because I've kept my eyes fixed on Jesus. If you say, well, no, I'm using Jesus to point me to some other cause, some other agenda you might be correct for a moment, but remember, that's a wandering star, and pretty soon it's going to lead you off into places you never really wanted to go. God so loved the world that he didn't send a political party or a social movement. He sent his son. The coming of his son has deep and profound and powerful social and political ramifications, but those come out of our orientation to Christ and not an allegiance to a temporal movement. Or politics. So be still and know. Be still and know and pay attention to the word of revelation given to you by the Holy Spirit. The word that reveals to you that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Then navigate through life in the light of of the star of revelation that leads you to Jesus Christ so that you become a modern magi. The magi went on their way. And behold, the star which they had seen at its rising went before them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. Why? Because they found what they were looking for. It was a long, hard journey. They made it because they knew it was worth it. But when the star finally stopped, they knew that they had found what they were looking for. And oh, such joy. Such joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The star of Bethlehem is not to be found in a recreation of ancient astronomy. So I'll, I'll get, I'll get the, the star charts from the ancient Persians, and I'll study them. And I'll find the star of Bethlehem. No, you won't. It isn't found that way. The star of Bethlehem is the revelation that arises in your heart in response to the prophetic word of the gospel. The star of revelation rises in your heart when you hear the proclamation of the gospel. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. That's my message. That's my sermon. That's my proclamation. That's my announcement. That's my kerygma. That's what I came to say. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. That's what you're looking for. What are you looking for? You're looking for Jesus, who is the Christ, who is the Son of God, who is the Savior of the world. And once that begins to rise in your heart, you can say, ha, huh, I found the one that I've been looking for. And then you worship. And you're overwhelmed with joy. It doesn't mean that you won't have hard times. Of course you will. 
but you've found what you've been looking for all your life. Yesterday was the 17th anniversary of Caleb and Ashley's wedding. Is that right, Perry? Did I get it right? 17? Seems like it was about six years ago, but that's not the case. It was 17. Married on New Year's Day. And I remember that I had a friend come all the way from Russia to be here for that. Igor Nikki Nikitin. He passed away in 2015, but he's one of my dearest friends. And I remember him telling the story about how he'd come to faith in Christ in Russia during the Soviet era. His mother, Nina, was a Communist Party member. In fact, she was a member of the KGB. In fact, she ran a reprogramming camp in Siberia for dissidents, including people like Christians. Nikki, in fact, was born in a reprogramming camp in Siberia run by his KGB communist mom. And then in his teen years, he encounters Christ. The day star began to rise in his heart. And he starts a, well, a de facto church in his apartment. Well, his mom's apartment. So while his mom's out there trying to reprogram Christians, Nikki's back in the apartment programming Christians. This went on for a while until Igor and his dear friend Dmitri, who's one of my best friends, Dmitri Poliakov, said, well, we got to tell your mom. So they prayed and they fasted and they fasted and they prayed and they sat down one day and they explained to Nina, KGB communist member atheist, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she began to weep. And said, this is what I've been looking for all my life. The star had stopped and shone on Jesus. And she was overwhelmed with joy and became a worshiper of Christ. The story of the Magi ends with them returning to their own country, but by another way. Of course, by another way. Because when you encounter Jesus, it changes you because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Stand with me. And let's prepare now to come to the table of the Lord. Join with me in confessing our response to the gospel announcement, the confession of our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now join with me in confessing our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, And by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And God is gracious to all who confess their sins and in humility Ask for mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven.